was calm. All was bright. Yet could this be the same God of Abraham, the conqueror of Israel? This baby, this fragile life. Is this child the one who burned his name in rapture across the gasping skies? Whose voice spoke the oceans into crashing rhythms? Who crafted the mountains into guardians of the firmament? Whose hand ignited the thirst of the deserts and the warring surge of the elemental hosts? Who breathed life from dust? Broke the oppressor's rule, scattered the chains of his people like sand, and led them through the wilderness with a pillar of flame. Is this child the one whose presence billowed thunderous on Sinai's peak? Who surrounded Job with the roaring wind, stood defiant in the raging furnace, wrote judgment against tyrants, and blazed on the lips of the prophets? Scorching history's pages with the fury of his might. Could this be the same God who chose to come as the vulnerable king, setting his throne on straw and manger, drawing forth the tears of shepherds, receiving the gifts of wandering travelers, his fame unknown in this world? Jesus, the one who thunders through the heavens, yet whispers to our hearts, who reigns victorious, yet bows to serve the broken. He is God in the fury, God in the silence. He holds this mystery balanced in his hands, holds our questions till they lose their need, until all we see Well, good morning. It's uh, good to see you here this morning as uh, we continue our second week of messages that are based upon Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and we're going to be looking at that passage of Scripture here pretty soon. And and, uh, just to remind you that really that we want to make sure that our Christmas celebration is focused on the right things and the right one, and that's Jesus himself. Last week, Pastor Tarkowitz began this series talking to us about a phrase that uh, was in Isaiah chapter 9, and before he did that, he told told us a little bit of the history of what was going on in Israel at that time, and then he shared with us about the first phrase that we find, wonderful counselor, and uh, there are these four phrases that are in there, and we're going to be looking at the second one this morning in just a few moments. But before we read that passage of Scripture, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever been to a live performance of Handel's Messiah? Anybody here ever been? Wow, that's great. Good, good. That's an awesome thing to hear because it's loaded when the choir sings with them and stuff. It's just loaded with Scripture. There's three parts to Handel's Messiah. The first part is about the nativity and the prophecies leading up to it. The second part is about the passion of Jesus Christ. And the third part is about his resurrection and his glorification that happens there. And uh, it's just the scriptures that you hear. And one of the scriptures we're going to be reading this morning is really one that we often hear played during this time of year and things and where it goes, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace, you know. Not a very good rendition right there. But anyhow, um, it's, it's those words that happen there. I don't know if you've, when, when you go to that or a number of years ago, Pam and I, back in the 1990s, we had the opportunity to hear the young Messiah, which was, uh, where they adapted, the first part was about the Messiah from Handel's Messiah, and then the second part was contemporary, more Christian kind of music that was about the birth of, of Christ, and we had the opportunity to go twice. And the reason for that was, is because of this man, we're, we're uh, kind of behind there, there we go, Ralph Carmichael. And uh, Ralph Carmichael, anybody know who Ralph Carmichael is? Anybody here? Just a few hands going up. Ralph Carmichael is the father of contemporary Christian music. You look him up online, there's all kinds of things about him 
online. And the, the songs that we sing, this is the man who brought that kind of music into the church. And uh, he's considered the father of contemporary Christian music. And in the 1990s, um, actually, this man knew people like Bing Crosby, Ella Fitzgerald, Pat Boone. And some of the young people might not know those names, but those were famous singers, um, people like um, Andre Crouch and the Winans and Bing Crosby. He worked with these kind of people. And in the 1990s, Ralph came to church here twice and was actually in church here. And the reason that he was here, though, is that his father-in-law was Reverend Don F. Price, who um, came to church here until he was 98 years old. And uh, when he passed away, went home to the, to the Lord. And it was quite an honor to have uh, Ralph Carmichael come here. But he was just kind of an ordinary guy, dressed rather ordinary. He used to call me preacher. Whenever I'd see him, he'd say, hey, preacher, how you doing? And uh, his, he was the son of a, a minister down in uh, Illinois as well. And because of that, we were able to go to the young Messiah and uh, to hear that because we took Pastor Price to it. Well, if you've ever been there, what does the congregation or the, uh, those in attendance do when they play the Hallelujah Chorus? Does anybody know? They stand up. And it's just this moving thing when they get to Hallelujah. The whole place stands up out of respect and honor to Jesus Christ and the words that are being sung. So this morning, we're going to be reading Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read verses 2 through 7. And I'm going to be reading them from the ESV this morning. But we're going to stand as we read them uh, this morning, um, kind of in honor, because this passage of Scripture is in Handel's Messiah. And uh, so we're going to be reading it. So would you stand with me? And when we get to verse 6, I'm going to invite you to read it with me, okay? That we read it together. All right, beginning in verse 2, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelled in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood, will be turned as fuel for the fire. And let's read this together. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And let us pray. Father, I thank you for the word of God, for what it says, what it teaches, for it truly brings us, Lord, the light that you want us to know and how we can live. It shows, Lord, your hand throughout history in what you have planned. And Lord, we would just pray today that as your spirit inspired the word and inspired the writers of this word that today, Lord, that you would use this man to bring your truth and that you would use us as a people to hear what your spirit has to say. That it would be more than words, but it would be inspiration in how to live and what to believe. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For to us, the, the, the uh, Isaiah wrote, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Four or five terms, because some believe wonderful is separated, from counselor, but four terms that describe a child to be born, a babe in a manger, 
Today, we also use titles to describe who people are, maybe what they do. If I were to say to you, John Bison, who knows who John Bison is? Only a few hands going up. Do you know that he is the this, this state, well, the elect, Senate elect senator for our district to the state of Michigan? And if I put that on there, that he is a senator, you start to think about, oh, this is somebody who has something to do with our government. How many of you know who Jack Reed is? How many here who knows Jack Reed is? Some hands going up. Jack Reed, if I were to say to you, Mayor of Marshall, Jack Reed, immediately, oh, somebody involved in government in the city of Marshall. If I were to say to you, Mark Walker, how many know Mark Walker? Yeah, a lot of hands going up. But if I were to say to you, Dr. Mark Walker, it automatically says this is someone who is educated probably in the medical field, and practices medicine, an MD. If I were to say to you, Chris Tarkowitz, how many of you know Chris Tarkowitz? Yeah, everybody, you know, just about, hope oh, most of you know Chris Tarkowitz. But if I were to say that name to somebody in the community, they might go, yeah, well, yeah. But if I say Pastor Chris Tarkowitz, it automatically says someone who shepherds a flock, someone who's a member of the clergy, someone who might be leading a church. And it gives us insight into what that person does. And the same is true of what we just read, that it's just not a child that is going to be born. We're giving four phrases that tell us something about who this child is going to be. Last week, Pastor Tarkowitz mentioned in his me message that God gave this early birth announcement only 700 years before it happened. You know, and some of us chuckled just like this morning when we think about it. And then he talked about his own birth. And remember, he put up this card like this, and uh, he, he, he just said, that, what if my parents sent this card out? And what was really interesting, he will be called pastor, one with receding hairline and one who drinks too much coffee. <laughs> You know, and we all laughed just like you all laughed here, you know, and I got a big chuckle out of it and both services that I sat in and, and I listened to that, you know, and it's kind of humorous. But, you know, there was one who knew that he would have a receding hairline. There was one who knew that he would drink too much coffee. And that's God himself. Just like God knew about this child, that was going to come and be born, be a human and walk here on this earth. It wasn't the only announcement of the Savior's birth. There are at least 10 references in the Old Testament that refer to Jesus' birth. They begin back, clear back, thousands of years before in the book of Genesis. You could see them on the screen that he would be the offspring of a woman in Genesis 3.15 that he would be born from a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14, that he would be called the Son of God in Psalms 2, 7, that he would be a descendant of Abraham, even telling us among all the people what line that he would come through. And then it narrows it down from the line of Isaac, not Ishmael. Isaac, it says in Genesis uh, 2, 21, 22, 8, 21, 12, from the nation of Israel, in Numbers 24, 17. From the tribe of Judah, it tells us, and then from Judah, who was one of 12 sons, in his family, the family of Jesse. And in the family of Jesse, from his sons, the house of David, and even the place in Bethlehem, that this one who would be born. And it has been calculated that for one person to fulfill these prophecies would be one in 10 to the 21st power. Now, Chris and I were just having a conversation about that. We don't even know what that number is. But it's got to be in the billions. That one person would come along and fulfill 
all these prophecies. And he will be called, it says, the mighty God. Kind of paradoxical when you think about it. A baby? Mighty God? I mean, when you think about it, a baby, I mean, a baby can't take care of its own needs. It can't walk, can't talk, can't feed itself, can't clothe itself, nor defend itself. It's totally dependent upon others. Mighty God? Yes, that's how he came. He will have limitless power if he is the mighty God. And mighty God comes from the Hebrew, two Hebrew words, El Gabor. And El is short for Elohim. Elohim is the first word that God uses to describe himself in the Old Testament. Elohim. It means one who has authority, one who is strong. It's one of the most common used phrases to describe God in the Old Testament. And Gabor is this adjective that modifies it and means mighty. So we could say that that word means mighty, mighty God, baby. This one that was to come. And I'll tell you what, I'm glad he is. Because it took a mighty God to change the course of our history as humanity. And in John, in the New Testament, he gives us his own description of this mighty God. So if you have your Bible this morning, I'm going to ask that you would turn to John's Christmas story found in 1 John chapter 1. If you'd turn there this morning. It says, give you a moment to get there, 1 John, or John, Gospel of John chapter 1. And it reads, we're talking about the, the mighty God. In the beginning was the Word. Now the Word here is referring to Jesus. And the Word is, in the beginning was this mighty God. He was always there. And the Word was with God. In fact, the Word was God. He is the mighty God who has in the beginning and will always be. And it says, all things, in the, he was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Nothing was created by him. Why? Because he is the mighty God. In him was life going to have life, it comes from the mighty God. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, which is an interesting word, overcome or comprehend, as the NIV puts it, because that word has a double significance. It means to grasp with the mind to comprehend. I got it, comprehend. But it also means to grasp with the hand, to overcome or to destroy. Nine out of 15 times it's meant to destroy. And so even though evil or those tried to destroy this word, it couldn't because he was the mighty God. Dropping down to verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, referring back to creation, because he is the mighty God. And, the, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but God. You become a child of God because he is the mighty God. He has the ability to do that. 
And then we come to the Christmas story in John. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, and down to 16. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. In other words, when Jesus came into the flesh, when he was born a babe, we got to see God in action in human form right here on this earth. God demonstrating his mighty power. When Jesus grew, grew up and as he was growing, people marveled. When he was 12 years old, he, the people marveled at the knowledge that he had when he was in the temple. When he started his public ministry, people marveled at him because he did things outside of normal nature. He did supernatural kind of things. We call them miracles. And how did he do them? Because he was the mighty God. Everywhere Jesus went, people watched him heal people. He healed their bodies. He healed their minds. He healed their souls. He cast out demons. And how could he do it? Because he was the mighty God. Everywhere Jesus went, people watched him and were amazed by what he did. Just in one small portion of Scripture in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus is teaching 5,000 men out in the middle of nowhere. And the, at the end of that passage, it says that was 5,000 men, not counting the women, not counting the children. So he's probably teaching 10,000 there. And it tells us that while he was teaching them, he realizes that they are hungry and he wants to feed them. And all they can find is five loaves and two fish. And he feeds over 10,000 people with five loaves and two fish. How could he do that? Because he was the mighty God who was born in a stable. It tells us at the end of that passage that that evening he sends out his disciples across the Sea of Galilee and there was turmoil on that sea that night and they were rowing against the wind. And he sends them out there and he goes up on a mountain to pray. About 3 a.m., he decides he's going to join his disciples out there. He doesn't hire somebody to row him out in a boat. He doesn't get in a boat himself to row out. He simply walks on water and walks out to where they are. How could he do that? What man can do that? He did it because he is the mighty God. And as he did this and he walked out, and the and his disciples saw him coming. They were frightened. And Peter, when they realized that it is Jesus, gets out of the boat and walks on water himself. This isn't because of Peter. This isn't because Peter had the ability to do this. It was because Jesus saw his faith, and Peter was so locked in on Jesus and what Jesus could do. And Jesus is the mighty God who enabled him to walk on water because he was, he is the mighty God. Born in a stable, laid in a manger, this mighty God. The disciples terrified, Peter walking on the water. Jesus rescues Peter. Jesus get, climbs in the boat and he does something that just amazes them as well. He stands up in that boat, and though the wind was blowing and the waves were probably close to swamping them, he stands up in the boat and he speaks to the wind and he speaks to the, to the sea, and he calms them. What man can do that? Only the mighty God can. And he did it. Oh, how we wish we could when the tornado comes or when the hurricane comes, just to speak to the wind and to stop it. But we cannot. There's only been one who ever could, and it is Jesus himself, the mighty God. And he wasn't finished there. 
because there was another sea that he wanted to conquer, another people that need to be rescued. You see, from each of us trickles from us a little stream of sin. We're all sinners, the Bible says. Everyone who ever walked upon the face of this earth is a sinner. And that our little sin trickles down into like a little stream on the ground, and it's Dave's sin and my sin and your sin, and that stream flows down and joins the stream in other communities, and we form a creek of sin that flows, and that creek of sin flows into the rivers that goes over the all of humanity, and that all gathers into this great sea of sin and death. And it's all there. It consumes all men who have ever tried to conquer it. It consumes every one of them. And Jesus, the one who stood up in the boat and calmed the sea, calmed the wind, stands in the midst of that sea, and it appears that it has overcome him too. For he dies. He's buried for one day, two days. And on the third day, he arose. He defeated in his resurrection death and in his death sin. He conquered that sea that consumes all men. And how could he do that? He did it because he is the mighty God that is there for us. He arose and he gave us victory. But he isn't just the mighty God of biblical times of 2,000 years ago. He's the mighty God of today as well. He's enabling people today, just like he enabled Peter to walk on that water, to do marvelous things, to have it in him, to help others, to be used by him and by his power as they put their faith in their belief in him. And I want you to see this video this morning of one of our families right here and how God is using them. Everybody. Merry Christmas from the Williamses. I'm Ross. I'm Connie. Mimi. And this is Kobe. I met Ross. He was, um, I was working at Oakland Hospital and he was my patient. <laughs> and I liked him and he couldn't take the hint when I was being friendly while he was patient. So uh, I kind of crossed a line and got his phone number from his chart and called him after he was discharged. <laughs> I had a biological daughter, Mindy, who was born with special needs. Um, and I was a single mom when I met Ross. After we, you know, brought Mindy home, and we uh, started working with the state because we had troubles getting things for, for our own kid. And we said, you know, why is, why, why is this like this? So we decided that we were going to do what we could do to help other parents in the system that were having the same problems. And, and from there came the Family Support Network. Family Support Network and the Family Hotline for Michigan. Ross and I were the founding parents for that. And then uh, we took lots of trainings with the state and we became um, parent mentors for other parents of kids with special needs. And then as the years passed, we became foster parents, but only to children who had special needs. Our last last one was, she weighed, what, like a pound four when she was born. She was with us four or five months. She came home with us when she was like up to four pounds something, and when she left after four to five months, she still was only around seven pounds. Her biological parents started coming to our house and we started training them on how to take care of her and how to nurture her. They caught on really well and they ended up taking her home. They took so her it home. Was, it was an amazing thing. It was 
you know, nothing shy of a miracle that that was able to happen. Of course, we adopted Kobe. Kobe was a shaken baby. He, he's one of God's miracles, there's no doubt about it. Because when we first day we went to see Kobe, they had told Connie on the phone, just come and sit with him, that's all we want you to do because he won't live long enough to come home from the hospital with you. So we went over and met him and immediately we fell in love with him. And obviously God had other plans from what the doctors had in mind because here we are 18 years later. Kobe, it's not your time, you got more work to do. You have more people to see and see what, what I have to say about life, not what somebody else has to say about it. Right yeah. here is right here is our last one. <laughs> this is Amy. And Amy came to us five years ago. Her, her mom was not able to, after her dad passed, her mom was not able to take care of Amy and she came to us and we fell in love with her and here we are today and Amy come up to Connie and I the other afternoon and she said, Mom, Dad, there's one thing I want to ask you. And so we said, okay, what's that? She said, if I was to tell you that I only wanted one thing for Christmas. And I said, what's that, Amy? And she said, I want you guys to be my mom and dad. I want you to adopt me. You could have knocked me over with a feather. And unfortunately, legally wise, we cannot do that. But we told Amy, as far as we're concerned, Amy, you are Amy Williams. And we feel that God has led us in that direction. And he helps us strengthen ourselves, which in turn, we are able to, in the light of God, we are able to help others. God helps us so we can help others. And I want to thank Ross and his family for sharing that with us this morning. But it's evidence of the mighty God working, even today in this family, reaching out and being willing, like Peter, to get out of the boat to walk on the water, to put our eyes upon Jesus. And it raises the question then for all of us, are we looking to him? Are we seeing him as the mighty God who is there to help us? Or are we relying on our own strength, our own power? Are we trusting the mighty God who created the world, calmed the sea, rescued the perishing, renews the spirit of man, heals the mind, the body, the soul, conquers death, and offers us eternal life. In that passage of John, it, it said there that not everybody receives him. Not everybody is called a child of God. Not because God doesn't want them to be, but because they choose not to be. Have you chosen God? He's calling. Are we listening and believing that he can not only change us, but change our destiny? And he can. Because he's the mighty God. What do you need to trust God with this morning? He can do it. Peter said, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. In other words, nothing's too big for God. When the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her what God was going to do, and she was not sure of all this, and she said, how can this be? What did the angel say to her? He said, nothing is impossible for God. Why? Because he's the mighty God. Nothing is impossible. So we don't celebrate 
this Christmas season, a helpless baby, born in a stable, laid in a manger. We celebrate the mighty God, the wonderful counselor, the everlasting father, the prince of peace coming to earth to help us. Will we allow him to help us with eternity and with our needs? Not, and those titles are not just, not just in name, but they are what he can do. The question is, do you believe that he can cause you to walk on your sea, whatever it is? you believe. Let's pray. Lord, you have approached all of us on rough seas. And there are times we go through rough waters. You just ask us to believe just as Peter needed to believe when he stepped out of that boat. And Lord, I don't know where anyone is spiritually here, but I know two people who do, each of us and you. You know where we are at. And I would pray, Father, for anyone here today that has never surrendered their life to you, that they would realize that you are the mighty God who has the power to save. And that they would give their life to you. And for that person, Lord, that they're going through a struggle today, this week, this year, that they would fix their eyes upon you and realize that you are the mighty God who will walk with them, who will hold them up, who will help them through whatever it is. And so, God, for that person that may be struggling with salvation, they just simply need to tell you that. They need to simply say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know it. I'm one in that sea of sin and death. But I know that you have come to rescue me. And today... I want to be rescued. I put my faith, and my trust in what you can do, that you will grant me the forgiveness of sin and make me one of your children. So I thank you. Thank you that you spoke to me today and you called my name. I give you my life and I receive you. In Jesus' name I ask it, and I state it, amen. If you've asked Christ into your life, make sure that you let that be known and that you have received him.